RuneScape has changed much in the 20 years since its initial release. Many of us long for that magical experience it provided when we first started playing. My quest is to recreate that experience by playing a time-locked Iron Man. In order to progress forward in time, I'll have to experience all of the content as it is released on a month-to-month -month basis. My name is Kuda Bear, and welcome to Time Traveler Iron Man. Before August 2001, PvP and RuneScape looked a lot different than what we have today. When creating an account, players could choose whether they wanted to play a safe non-PvP mode, or a dangerous PvP always enabled mode. The PvP mode was a lot like playing in a modern day PvP world. Players could attack anytime, anywhere. However, in August, Jagex turned the system on its head and instead changed all accounts over to the non-PvP mode throughout most of the game world. The catch was this, a new massive area was added to the map at the same time. This area was practically as big as the rest of the existing world map and was full of treasures to loot and monsters to kill. This area was unique in that it would always be PvP enabled for all players. In August 2001, the wilderness was born. Deep within exists a new highest level mob and a new best in slot item for me to obtain. Then in September, after three months with no new quests, RuneScape's most iconic adventure was released. Players had been suggesting adding dragons to the game for a long time, and now they got their wish. Elvarg was released into the game, along with all of the terror and suffering she brought upon the towns of Gilinor. This multi-part quest required the player to venture across most of the existing world and the new wilderness to complete. If players were able to defeat the horrifying creature, they would be rewarded with the ability to purchase and equip one of the most iconic pieces of equipment ever, the Runite Plate Body. August and September 2001 are two of the most iconic months for RuneScape, with two of the most memorable additions ever made being added. Are you ready to explore? Let's go ahead and jump into September 2001. Hello, and welcome to the Wilderness. It is August 2001, and the Wilderness is officially released. Of course, we have to go out and explore and see what kind of benefits and treasures we can reap out in the dark unknown. But I'm a bit of a sissy, so I'm only bringing a couple of items. If I die, oh well, I should be able to keep them. I do have some food though, so hopefully that'll get us through. Let's go check it out. So the biggest unfortunate part about the wilderness is that no area of terrain in this game has been more updated, balanced, modified, and changed than the wilderness. The wilderness has been given so many revitalization updates that it really just doesn't look like it did back in RuneScape Classic. There are many of the features that existed back then still here, but there are even more that weren't, and I won't be able to benefit from those in any way. Also, some of them will even be a detriment, like some of the boss monsters out here. I'll have to route around them to avoid them to make sure I don't die. Here's one right here, the Elder Chaos Druids. I won't be able to kill those, even though the Chaos Altar did exist out here back in the day. Of course, the Ferox Enclave, one of the best updates probably to the wilderness overall. There's so many useful things in there. is not added for well over 15 years, so I will be staying far away from entering that town. Near the Ferox Enclave, however, is a statue, and this statue is well thought to be a reference to a famous player from back around this time called the Old Knight. He was one of the first players to max in the game and then unfortunately passed away, and this was thought to be added as a tribute. If I remember correctly, it was originally said that that was not added as a tribute and it was just a coincidence, but the community has pretty much made it a tribute, so regardless of whether it was added intentionally or not, that's what it really stands for now. So here's the bandit camp. The bandits inside have been buffed to be like a level 130, but generally speaking, the bandit camp has pretty much not changed since it was added. There's a general store and a pizza store in there that might be useful. The general store in particular was updated to buy things for above high alchemy value, so I might be using that to gain a little bit of extra money. Just to the south of the bandit camp is the Dark Warrior's Fortress, which was also added. Uh, the mobs in there were also very increased in level, so they're pretty strong. However, there's a couple rune spawns in there that might be useful, though they are pretty low level runes. All the way up in the very northwestern corner of the release section of the wilderness, there's actually a cosmic rune spawn. And this could be extremely useful, as the only other way I'm able to get them is by killing monsters. And it's a massive three per spawn, so I could definitely see myself coming up here to collect some. 
Also, the entire member side of the wilderness is not yet released, so everything north of the fence here I don't have access to, but everything south that was released, I do. Of course, rune rocks were released with this update. I could actually mine and smith runeite if I had the level to do so, but due to my excessive grinding exceptions, I'm not going to actually do that. But this was when it was first available to do that. Just to the south here are the lava dragons, but back in the day they were the actual just red dragons, which actually weren't released for a couple months yet. I don't know what was here before then. I don't know if the lava maze was even here. It's really hard to know what went on in the wilderness before uh, RS2 release date, because nothing was mapped officially. On top of this hill here, there's actually a cut sapphire spawn, which could come in handy when there's more things to do with sapphires. I think this used to be a house, but now it's just a hill. But that is one of the only gems, uh, natural gem spawns that I have in the entire game, so I could be taking use of that. Now way over here in the very northeastern corner of the unlocked area are the Greater Demons. And these are the only Greater Demons I have access to, so I will be returning here in the future to kill these guys for the Rune Full Helm. And actually one really cool aspect about the Demonic Ruins is there's a very slow prayer restoration effect if you're standing within the building. So I will be able to take advantage of that even though that update wasn't technically provided for a long time just because that would fall under the realm of uh, things that were changed that I could use because I would be here killing them anyway. Very nearby the greater demons there are two nature rune spawns. I want to say one is three and one is four. They're only accessible on this island so you have to telegrab them but the cool thing is I might be able to exchange extra law runes for nature runes if that makes sense in the future. And I almost walked right into Callisto. Yeah don't do that. Glisto <laughs> I also don't have access to. And to the south of me is poison spiders, which if I get poisoned I can't even cure myself because there's no anti-poison yet. No, don't do it dragon. Spare me. I don't need to get involved with you till later this month. Okay, we're good. One thing you notice about the wilderness is every monster is aggressive regardless of level. It's kind of interesting. I think originally this was how most areas functioned in RuneScape Classic. They took it away for the safe areas, but left it for the wilderness, so even these low-level mobs getting on me can be a little annoying. And deep within the lava maze here, there is probably the most game-breaking part of the wilderness. The muddy chest. No, it's actually the steel plate body spawn. You've probably seen this dozens of times on other people's Iron Man series. This is such an incredible source of money for early game Iron Man that it is just completely game-breaking for me. I can basically come out here and get 50,000 coins within 15-20 minutes total. That easily is 5-10 to 10 times faster than my fastest money-making method before this. So money should become far less of an issue from here on out. The other thing added out here is the muddy chest. If I kill chaos dwarves also located here in the wilderness, I can get a muddy key and I can open that and I will be doing that later this month. Also located here in the lava maze there is a staff of earth spawn. Sometimes people will grab that in place of the steel plate body since it tends to be less popular and it still sells for 900 coins which is pretty good. So that'll be a backup if I need it. Here's the hobgoblin mine. It's probably the biggest mining location in the entire wilderness, but there's a couple other useful mines as well. There's just so many rocks here, it's like no other area currently released. Unfortunately, because I have the bank now, I very likely won't be using this mine at all. However, if I was still an Ultimate Iron Man, this would probably be one of the best places for me to train smithing, as there's a nice little loop you can do between the ore furnace and the anvil, provided you can survive the mobs. Located here in the ruins by the furnace, there's actually a gold ore spawn. I don't see that being very useful, but it's notable that it is probably one of the only natural ore spawns I have access to. If ever I'm feeling lazy, I'll come out here and grab some gold ore from here rather than going to mine it myself. And right next to the gold ore spawn, there's a steel plate leg spawn. This is always a really good thing to come to if you don't want to head all the way out to level 50 wilderness. For example, if I was still a hardcore Iron Man, I would probably consider collecting those instead of plate bodies since level 27 is a lot safer. And the last thing I want to showcase out here is actually the bone yard. And you'll notice there's big bones on the ground here. And officially, because it's August, Big Bones are released, so I have a faster way of training prayer than just killing chickens. If I come out here and camp Big Bones, I think it's somewhere around 1 to 2,000 experience an hour. And this is actually quoted on the RS Classic Wiki as being a decent prayer training method pretty much forever. Prayer was not easy to train in Classic for sure. I don't have much reason to train prayer for a while, 
but this might be become an option when I need to do so. And the very last thing I'll do before I head back to the safety of Varrock is grab some planks because I'll need those later and you probably know why. Funnily enough, when this update first came to be, the only place to collect planks was way out here in the wilderness. You couldn't get them from the sawmill, there were no other natural spawns. And back to the safety of the ditch, which actually was added I think around 2007 or so? I think right before the backup of OSRS was made. Originally it was just an invisible line that once you cross you could be attacked, so it was really easy to get lured if you weren't familiar with where exactly the wilderness started. This made a very clear divider visually, so it made it a lot harder. Maybe, I don't know, some people still got lured. So that actually concludes our exploration of the wilderness, but we're not done out there. Of course, we have to hunt those greater demons to get the rune full, and there's one other thing I have to do out there. Before we do that, however, I'm going to take a quick detour and do a couple inventories of tuna and swordfish. I will need these for this month. However, the banking time is ridiculously long. I have to walk all the way to the West Folidor Bank in order to bank these things. So I'm only going to do exactly what I need and no more in hopes for a more efficient method in the future. So one really cool thing about the game growing around this time was that additional banks were added. This included the Barak East and Folidor East banks as well as the Draenor bank here. This will be extremely handy for me to be able to bank my food that I'm cooking without having to walk all the way across the world. I've also noticed that I already broke the bank limit, so I'm gonna have to downsize a bit here. That should do for now. I'll drop my molds because I don't really need them, and I'll just equip some armor. But I think in the future I'm probably gonna have to make sure I downsize even further. Oh yeah, looking good. Let's get some more fishing done. Okay, so I've done about four inventories of fishing, and that should be enough. Doesn't look like a whole lot, but I think it'll get us through all of our grinds for the rest of the month. So, next thing we're gonna move on to the Greater Demon grind. We of course have to go unlock the Runeful Helm, which is gonna be the next step. So let's go ahead and get that done. This is the only place in the game that I can actually kill Greater Demons, here at the Demonic Ruins. So if I wear the Monk's Robes and Holy Symbol and pray melee, I will never run out of prayer, so I can safely melee these guys to my heart's content, which is pretty in incredible. I was originally considering not using this benefit, but actually the main methodology I would have used to kill these guys is to actually just pray, wait till my prayer runs out, and then suicide, and run back up and repeat it all over again. So because of the fact that this is really what I was going to be doing anyway, I think I'm just going to allow it. The Runeful Helm is a 1 out of 1 to 8, and I also need a Missile Kite Shield from these guys, which is also a 1 out of 1 to 8. So obviously I am training attack, as I will be needing attack levels for some unlocks coming in the next couple of months, which you're probably pretty familiar with if you know what I'm talking about. Alright, let's get this Runeful Helm. So I actually realized that I can safely pray improved reflexes and protect from melee and not go down in prayer. If I tried to go to incredible reflexes, I would start losing prayer, so I have to stick with the 10% prayer. Why? Why does this always happen to me? <laughs> this is the one 1 out of 2 8 drop that I don't care about. It is good money at least. Something. But seriously, why? I want either of the other ones. <laughs> yep. Yep. Alright, 41 strengths. Now I can swap back to attack safely and should still be able to hit 9s while praying uh, superhuman strength. You have to be kidding me. It's only been 40 kills, but still. What is going on? Alright, that is just over half of the kills. I'm actually going to head back now and bank what I have. I have almost 20,000 in loot, and I really don't want to lose it at this point. That's actually a lot of cash for me. And I think it's worth heading all the way back down to Varrock to bank and come back up. Nature runes are definitely coming in handy, and I still don't have a good source of them, so hopefully I don't run out. I've only got 15. But even these troll adamant plate leg drops are really nice because now I already have a 20k cash stack from that trip. Alright, so this is the 128th Greater Demon kill. That means I'm officially at the drop rate for both the Mithril Kite Shield and the Runeful Helmet, and I have received neither. At least I haven't received any more adamant plate legs since the <laughs> last pair I got. Number 4 160 kill count. Oh no. Oh no. No. There is 50 attack. 
Still no sign of either of the drops we're looking for. Up to 175 kill count. That would be number 6. Alright, there it is, the Rune Full Helm. After 208 kills, we've achieved it. Go ahead and throw that bad boy on. Nice upgrade over the medium helmet. We're good to go. Let's go ahead and bank it before I lose something. Alright, so we can actually go ahead and just high elk this Rune Med Helm since we don't need it anymore. We've got the Rune Full Helm, which is pretty much an upgrade. I guess technically if I was ranging, I might want to use the med, but I don't think I actually will. Also go ahead and high elk the rest of these shameful adamant plate legs. Seven total before we received the Rune Full Helm. That is just ridiculous. So, you might realize that we're still missing one unlock from Greater Demons, and that's the Mithril Kite Shield. However, I don't think I'm actually going to go back out and hunt for it. I have a backup plan, and that's actually just to train up my smithing a bit. I'm already 60 smithing from the Power Amulet grind, and if I was to get one more level, I could use a Dwarven Stout to go all the way up to 62 smithing. So that's what I'm going to do. I've already pretty much got all of the ore I need in the bank. I've got this Mithril Ore, I need some more coal to go with it, so I'll be mining some more coal. And then I've also got this gold and silver ore I can smith and have been meaning to anyway. It seems like a pretty good time to do it, as I'll be able to sell the goods I smith for money. So one of the smaller additions now in August was actually the Mining Guild. Thankfully I already have the level to go down, thanks to the Power Amulet grind. And of course only this first section of the Mining Guild was available. The expansion isn't added until much later, but this is still really beneficial to me as it provides a very close location to get coal, as the Falador East Bank was now released at this point as well. So depositing this batch of coal means that I will have enough coal to smelt all of the mithril ore that I've got here. And of course we're actually going to smelt here again at the Falador Furnace. Five bars at a time, this will take a little bit. Okay, so this is the last of the gold I had to smelt. I cleaned up the silver ore and the gold ore I had in the bank in two bars just to save on bank space only. Honestly, it's kind of becoming a bit of a struggle. I'm constantly running out of bank space, so I figured combining those stacks would be good. But otherwise, we have the 275 mithril bars here. We can go ahead to Varrock and smith them into uh, mithril short swords, which will be the best source of money from these bars. Before I do that though, I'm going to go ahead and buy a couple Dwarven Stouts while I'm here, so I can use those to boost for the Kite Shield when I get 61. Before I forget to though, I'm going to make one Mithril Axe, just so I have it for the future and I don't have to go out of my way to get bars again. And of course, I have unfortunately undershot my goal again. I did not have enough material to be able to get the smithing level up required in order to make the Mithril Square Shield, so I'm going to have to go get a little bit of iron. So it actually kind of worked out. I forgot that I needed to get some steel bars to smith some steel nails for our quest coming up. So this allowed me to have an opportunity to do that. That's 61 smithing though, so I'm going to go ahead and make those nails. And then we can make the mithril kite shield and move on. Interestingly enough, there was no way to obtain steel nails in the game other than smithing them at this point or buying them from another player. So here they are, glad I had the smithing level in advance. So I can go ahead and sip this Dwarven Stout here, and then go ahead and smith the Mithril Kite Shield. So a bit of a workaround there from versus getting it from a Greater Demon Drop, but it's still the highest tier shield that I'm required to get as part of this month. That is a great unlock to have. I have a little bit of random things to clear out of my bank and sell, and then we'll move on. So like with the Holy Symbols, I'm going to hold on to the Mithril Swords I smithed since there's no real reason to sell them right now i don't really need the cash and i could potentially get more money for them in the future so i'll be saving them until i either need the cash or i can get the most out of them so the next thing i need is actually some law runes so i'm here at the ice warriors one more time to have the best consistent high level root drops of anything i have access to so i'll be here hopefully get some law runes quickly and if lucky some natures and cosmics as well Oh, and the support for autocasting was pretty good in the last episode, so I'm going to go ahead and keep autocasting. Alright, there's the law runes. I think we just need a couple more items and we can get started on this quest. And here we are, the beginning of one of the most iconic journeys in all of RuneScape, and honestly, our last journey before the world starts to change in incredible ways. 
let's go ahead and start Dragon Slayer. So we begin simply enough by speaking to the Guildsmaster of the Champions Guild, who just gives us the quest to go out and seek a rune plate body from Oziak, the plate body smith who lives up in Edgeville. Oziak lives unassumingly in this tiny house all the way up in northern Edgeville, but has some of the most powerful armor in the entire world just laying around his shack. So we're going to talk to him and see if he will sell us a rune plate body. Unfortunately, he will not, because he only sells to accomplished adventurers. And in exchange, he's going to give us a quest to go kill the dragon who lives on Crandor Island. He gives it to us kind of ironically, assuming that we will die on the way, and hoping he never has to actually sell us a rune plate body. So we return to the Champion Guildmaster to get some advice on how we actually go about killing this dragon. And thankfully he has a lot of really helpful advice. He lets us know that we can obtain a map to route to Crandor by finding three pieces that were lost and gives us clues to those. He also lets us know that we'll need to acquire a ship for transportation, as well as that we'll need special protection from the Dragon Breath, which the Duke of Lumbridge has and we could go obtain from him. So we'll begin by searching out the map in the first piece we're going to find and we need to ask the Oracle for a clue on how to obtain it and the Oracle gives us a very cryptic riddle that has something to do with the items in my inventory. The solution to the riddle is just to come to this very strange door here in the Dwarven Mine and add a silk, an unfired clay bowl, and a wizard's mind bomb into the door's little bowl, I guess, on the front. And adding all three of those items should unlock the door. Okay, let me add the lobster pot that I definitely always had in my inventory the whole time. And now the door is glowing and opening for me. Can't believe I forgot about the fourth item. But in this chest here, we will find the first map piece. Let's go ahead and continue the quest from here. The second map piece was actually stolen by Wormbrain, who went ahead and got himself locked up here in the Port Serum Jail. I'm going to ask him for the map piece, but he's going to want 10,000 gold for it. And I'm a bit of a cheapskate, so I'm not going to give him that, and instead, I'm just going to go ahead and murder his face. <laughs> Sorry, Wormbrain. And he drops it on the ground, which then we can use Telekinetic Grab to get it. So there's the second map done. The final piece is the most tricky to get as it's here within Melzar's Maze, which is actually a pretty complicated dungeon considering the time it was released. Effectively, you have to kill a particular monster in each room for it to drop a key, then use the correct door to keep going. So it would have taken a lot of trial and error to do this without a guide, but I'm definitely using a guide. It's interesting to me that the monsters just don't have like a flat 1 out of 2 or 1 out of 4 or whatever drop rate for the key. You actually have to kill the correct one. So you have to like keep killing the individual ones till you get it. Fun fact, actually. I think right around 2006, I actually wrote a fan fiction about RuneScape where Melzar's maze was turned into a Halloween event. So if that's something you guys want to see, let me know. <laughs> I might put out a bonus video about that. And here is our man Melzar himself. Unfortunately, he's gone mad. He's down here in the basement and he really likes cabbage. So unfortunately, we need to slay his face <laughs> in order to get his key to get, keep going. And lastly, we actually have to fight his pet lesser demon, which is obviously the most complicated part of this entire maze, or at least hardest part of this entire maze. I'm going to try to face tank in melee. Let's see how it goes. All right, pretty happy I didn't do the rune med grind with melee, as it's still pretty hard <laughs> to take on. But that'll be the last key, and with this key we're able to move to the final area which has a chest, and when we search it, we get the final map piece. So we can go ahead and use all three maps on each other to get the full Crandor map, and we know exactly where it is now. Next up is going to be to secure transportation. Let's go see if we can find a boat. Thankfully Clarence here in the Port Sarium docks is actually selling his ship and it's only 2,000 coins, so I'll be able to afford that and purchase it. 
So inspecting the ship that we just bought, unfortunately it has a giant hole in the hull, but with the materials I collected before, I'll be able to mend that right away and it'll be seaworthy. Pretty nicely, the boat also came with a cabin boy, but there's no captain. I don't know how to man a ship like this, so we're gonna have to find someone who will captain our ship for us to Crandor. Ned, the rope maker who helped us in the Prince Ali rescue quest, is actually a retired sailor. So he would be able to captain our ship for us all the way to Crandor, and thankfully he agrees right off the bat, no compensation required. So that is our transportation taken care of, our map taken care of. The last thing we need is our protection from Dragonfire, so let's go meet with the Duke of Lumbridge. Speaking with Duke Horatio in his bedroom for some reason, I don't know why we decided to meet here, <laughs> but he actually favors my quest as he would like to see the dragon dealt with as well. So he actually will give us for free a anti-dragon shield, which we'll be able to use to protect ourselves from the dragon breath. All right, now we are fully kitted up. We've got our transportation set. We know where we're going. Just need to gear up fully and go take out this dragon. All right, I've got my food. I've got my armor. I've got my special shield. Let's go and let's get this done. Come on, Ned, take us to Crandor. Here we are, we're on Crandor Island. Only I survived. The dragon attacked us out on the ocean. And, oh wait, Ned's here. All right, we're fine. Oh, that's the cabin boy perished? That's okay, I had insurance. Ned basically says, I'm gonna stay here, you go figure out what to do, so I will do it. On the island here, there's actually some moss giants, some more lesser demons, some hobgoblins, and a good collection of ores. Though this place is so distant from any banks that I don't know if I would ever consider mining this stuff. At the top of the mountain, there's a hole. And down the hole, there's a cave. And in the cave, there's the dragon. Before we engage the dragon though, I should walk down the tunnel here as there is a secret passage that I can open to get back here much faster. Without this, I would have to repair the boat and make poor Ned go through that entire traumatic experience all over again. So it's definitely worth opening this wall. It can only be opened from this side. All right, when I clamber over this wall here, it's do or die. Time to fight Elvarg. Let's go ahead and take her out. And with that killing blow, the dragon is slain. I'll go ahead and remove her head as a trophy to prove to Uziak that I've completed his quest. Incredible. Man, she can really deal out some damage, but thankfully I've kitted up and geared up enough that it wasn't too bad. Let's go ahead and take the long walk back to Edgeville. Funnily enough, I totally forgot to bring any fare for the way home, so I have to do the banana thing and get 30 coins to get out of here. <laughs> Oh great, customs. They're gonna hate that I have a severed dragon head in my inventory, aren't they? They're never gonna let me go. <laughs> okay, never mind, we're fine. All right, Mr. Oziak, here is your severed dragon head. Mounted on your wall? I don't care what you do, just give me my reward. 18,650 strength and defense experience and the ability to equip rune plate bodies. The experience puts me up to 44 strength and defense, which is really great. 60 combat from that as well. If I go ahead and train Oziak, I can see that he will sell me the rune plate body for 84 and a half thousand gold. So I'm going to go ahead and buy one right now as it's obviously best in slot. We can equip that bad boy and we look like an absolute champion. Full rune minus the shield. This is incredible. And of course. We will go ahead and say goodbye to the rune chain body 
We didn't have it a very long, but it did serve us well in the Elvarg fight, and we thank it for that. But it gives us a good 30k or so refund from elking it, so it's worth doing. So there is actually one more thing for us left to do this month, something that I totally forgot about after mentioning it at the beginning of the episode. So let's go out into the wilderness and get this done. I'm not really risking anything with this setup, just the strength amulet. I've got a lot of spare rubies in the bank if I need to, so I'm not too worried about it. Of course I'll be killing these chaos dwarves for a shot at a muddy key. Thankfully, the muddy key is a 1 out of 18, so it's really common, so we shouldn't be here a long time. Wow, that was incredibly fast. There's the muddy key, let's go unlock the chest. And of course, up by where we saw the plate body spawn is the chest itself. Let's go ahead and crack it open. The loot is actually pretty decent. You get some GP, a mithril bar, an anchovy pizza, some law, death, and chaos runes, and an uncut ruby, which could be handy. Alright, that's everything for this though, so let's go ahead and head back to the mainland. And of course, that will conclude our journey through September 2001. This month being one of the most iconic of the entire history of this game. We unlocked the Rune Full Helm from Graders and the Rune Plate Body from completing Dragon Slayer. That was an epic adventure and I'm so happy to have been along on it with you. As I hinted at before, things are going to start looking a lot different starting in the next month. There actually was barely any new features added to the game between September and February 2002. And in February 2002, there is a lot. It is going to be an awesome adventure, and I hope you'll join me for that as well. So, chatting with hands here, it looks like it's taken us about 21, almost 22 hours to complete September 2001, which is longer than expected. But I did need to do that Greater Demon Grind, which also took a lot longer than expected, going pretty dry on the Ruined Fall Helm. Next time we meet, we're going to be able to explore a whole new world. We'll finally be able to pass those fabled gates north of Falador and venture forth into the unknown beyond. What kind of riches and wonder will we discover? I guess we'll have to wait and see in Season 2 of Time Before, the Time Traveling Iron Man.